Good morning. The committee will come to order. Today, we have the opportunity to welcome the Honorable Jovita Carranza, the 26th Administrator of the Small Business Administration, to our committee. While there are many political and ideological differences represented on this committee, one thing we all agree on is the importance of small businesses to our nation's economy. America's 30 million small businesses are the cornerstones of our communities. When a Main Street business succeeds, America succeeds. Not only do hard-earned dollars get reinvested back into our neighborhoods, but we also see robust job creation and innovation. But launching a business is not easy fit. It can be inherently risky. Even the most careful planner can underestimate the costs associated with bringing an innovative idea to the marketplace. Sadly, too many fail in the first 18 months. That is why in 1953, Congress created the Small Business Administration. The SBA is the only federal agency tasked specifically with helping small businesses grow and succeed. Through its extensive network of field offices and resource partners, SBA connects entrepreneurs with technical assistance, capital, and federal contracting opportunities. It is imperative that the agency operates effectively so that small businesses can get the most out of these vital programs. To that end, we have held numerous hearings to see what is working and what can be improved. We have learned that one of the biggest challenges facing small businesses is access to capital, which is critical for a new business owner to start up, hire employees, and expand operations. Without adequate resources, small businesses fail to realize their full potential. SBA can play a vital role in filling the gaps through its loan programs. The committee has long supported the microloan program and more, and more recently, the Community Advantage Program. These two initiatives have gone a long way in reaching women, minorities, and veterans who otherwise will not be served by private sector lenders or even the 7 8 program. I hope we can work collaboratively to support and expand these initiatives. With that said, the lending needs of women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses is a top priority for me. I know Ms. Carranza has expressed an interest here as well, and I look forward to hearing more about the steps you will take to reach more of these entrepreneurs. Similarly, Increasing contracting opportunities for small businesses, especially from underserved communities, is a shared goal that I hope we can leverage to improve the 8-8 and hub zone programs. When small businesses win contracts, they scale up quickly and create good paying jobs. The result is a win-win for everyone. Just like contracting and lending, the SBA provides invaluable counseling services through its nation net, nationwide network of resource partners. They provide expert advice on how to develop a business plan, market a product, and sell their goods overseas. Despite the incredible success of the programs, the administration proposed to slash entrepreneurial development by a staggering $97 million, or 36%. Helping small businesses succeed and educating the underserved and rural areas will require a real investment in SBA counseling and training programs, not cutbacks. I think it's safe to say we all agree that small businesses are a cornerstone of our economy and deserve our full support. However, that requires more than lip service. It involves a real commitment to invest in its program and programs that really work. With that, I look forward to hearing from the administrator regarding her priorities for the agency on the FY21 budget proposal. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Madam Administrator, for coming before us today to share your vision of the SBA moving forward. As most of, uh, I think, people in this room know, uh, we think this is uh, the most bipartisan committee in Congress. 
both Ms. Velasquez uh, and I have had the opportunity to, to lead this committee in recent years, and regardless of who's in charge, we've worked together in a bipartisan fashion uh, to advance the goals of America's small business community. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from the President's newest cabinet member, the Honorable Jovita Carranza, the 26th administrator in the history of the SBA. Ms. Carranza was confirmed by the Senate last month by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, becoming the highest ranking woman of Latin American heritage in the federal government. I have to say, the President and the Senate got it right. I have had the pleasure of sitting down uh, with our new administrator, and I was impressed by her ideas on how to modernize and streamline the agency that's the only go-to resource and voice for small businesses backed by the strength of the federal government. Ms. Carranza brings a wealth of experience and a remarkable resume with her to the SBA. Her federal government experience includes her position as the Treasurer of the United States uh, her name is literally on our money, uh, as well as serving as the SBA's deputy administrator uh, from 2006 to 9 during former President George W. Bush's uh, administration. Before her work at the SBA, she had a distinguished 30-plus year career with the uh, uh, UPS, United Parcel Service, where she broke barriers as the highest ranking Latina in the company's history after starting as an hourly dock worker. So she worked her way up uh, to the top. Following her UPS career and initial SBA service, she founded her own small business, the JCR Group, a consulting firm that focused on business development and optimization. Administrator Carranza, we want to thank you again for taking your time to be with us. I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony and participating in the ensuing uh, discussion. And thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Uh, the gentleman yields back. And if committee members have an opening statement, we will ask that they be submitted for the record. I would now like to introduce our only witness today. Our witness is the Honorable Jovita Carranza, the 26th Administrator of the Small Business Administration. Administrator Carranza has an inspiring background. Born in Illinois to an immigrant family from Mexico, she began her career at UPS as a part-time night shift box handler, ultimately rising through the ranks to become president of Latin America and the Caribbean operations. After a Distinguished career at UPS, Administrator Carranza founded the supply chain company JCR Group. In 2016, 2006, President Bush taught her to become a deputy administrator for the Small Business Administration, and most recently, she was the treasurer of the United States. Welcome, Administrator Carranza. You recognize now for five minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to testify today. In the time we have today, let me share my priorities for the agency and update you on my activities since being sworn in as the administrator of the Small Business Administration on January 14. First, I'd like to share with you some background on my work and life experiences which helped me shape these priorities, some of which you've already covered. As you may recall from our recent conversations, I was raised in Chicago, but my work career began in California as a single mother raising a child and working part-time loading YES trucks for UPS. Over the years that followed, I was honored by public service opportunities in two administrations, as SBA Deputy Administrator, as U.S. Treasurer, and now as a Cabinet member. Throughout my career, I have seen the importance of small businesses to our economy and in communities across the country. This perspective guides me now in my focus and priorities at the agency. A top priority of mine is to continue the success of our disaster assistance program. Previously, the SBA's deputy administrator, as the uh, SBA's deputy administrator, I helped create the first disaster recovery plan one that the agency still uses today, and SBA plays a key role in helping disaster survivors recover from a disaster event. I can assure you that when a disaster strikes your st in your state or district, SBA is ready to help and will continue to be prepared under my leadership. 
Another priority of mine is to maximize our lending, federal contracting opportunities, and outreach to small businesses in underserved communities. It is imperative that SBA programs and services reach those that might, might not otherwise have access to capital, contracts, or counseling. In just my first month as administrator, I have already taken steps to encourage a greater focus to entrepreneurs from underserved communities. First, I have been working with our Capital Access Office to assess how we might grow our microloan program and further its success. I know that this is a goal for many of you that sh you share well. I also have been working closely with our contracting office to explore how we can exceed all our government-wide small business contracting goals and create further opportunities for minority women and veteran-owned small businesses. And I have been working closely with our field office leadership to ensure we are committed in our rural outreach and initiatives with HBCUs and minority-serving institutions. We need to reach those aspiring entrepreneurs, identify skill gaps, and help foster next generation workforce. Another priority is to optimize our agency program operations. SBA programs and services need to be available, accessible, and successful for small business owners. If not, then we need to change things, and I'm committed to do so without hesitation. One area of focus is with our SBIC program. We need to do better for those looking to invest in small businesses, and I am bringing an individual on Monday from the Treasury Department to help me objectively assess the program and identify areas for improvement. In the interim, I have prioritized staffing and outreach to better support program applicants and better identify future participants. Across the entire agency, I have looked at vacancies and am expediting hiring actions for critical staffing needs like those in our field operations. I have been meeting extensively with our contracting and IT offices to assess our recertification uh, infrastructure. I know that this is essential for small business contracting community. We will stand up our women-owned small business certification system in May. And soon as possible, we will complete our IT infrastructure enhancements to support all of our certification programs. My message to our staff has been clear and direct. Get it fixed and get it done. Finally, to support this examination of our program operations, one of my first meetings was with the SBA Inspector General. I developed a good working relationship with the IG and GAO in my previous positions, and I will continue that constructive engagement as administrator. As I close, let me reflect again on my life experiences which frame who I am today and serve as a guide to my tenure as administrator. It has been a rewarding journey to have been taught the value of a hard-earned dollar as a young girl and to later in life be able to sign my name on every U.S. dollar as treasurer. Now, as SBA Administrator, I have the chance to work with the inspiring men and women entrepreneurs that are so essential to our economy. Like so many of them, I am a product of hard work, mentorship, and opportunity. I bring that perspective to this new job and will be a tireless advocate for America's small businesses. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and the members of the committee. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Administrator Carranza. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Administrator, the SBA uh, 2021 budget proposes an 18% cut to the overall budget and a whopping 37% cut to the entrepreneurial development programs. These cuts make it clear that we cannot let me just say this, you know, we, we, on the one hand, we cannot say that this administration is for small businesses, that you care deeply about providing resources and enabling small businesses to take their businesses to the next step. And then on the other hand, proposing a budget that basically um, uh, render inoperative many of the programs that are so crucial. So in light of the huge tax cut given out to big businesses, 
How do you reconcile these steep cuts with your stated priorities to help more women, minority, and veteran entrepreneurs? One of the first things I did, uh, Chairwoman, was to take the budget and meet with the CFO as well as all of the key stakeholders in the SBA program offices. And line by line identified what was requested um, in, tw in, in 2020 and what was enacted and what was requested this time. And in particular, the uh, Office of uh, Entrepreneurial Development was a major concern because the SBDC, and I'm not going to shy away from that particular figure, because it's one that's realized a, a cut from 2020 request to the request in 2021, which is a, a, a small business development centers. And to face it head on, I did attend their SBDC summit to, um, to demonstrate to them that we were very serious about providing the support that they greatly need, and that I am closely reviewing the budget and how we can um, explore opportunities for them to be just as effective with the 87 million 860. So where That's is about the beef? a 13 percent reduction. Where is the beef? Pardon me. <laughs> you went to the SBDC conference. You talked to them. You promised them that you will provide the resources. As we see, this is a a a a, a steep cut. Mm -hmm. uh, are you are are you do you intend uh, to discuss um, this priority with Mr. Mulvaney and 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 said to him that I, it, it mm -hmm. this will affect mm -hmm. tremendously. Uh, the work and the mission of the SBA. Chairwoman, what I did at the, at the conference was to not only introduce my priorities and clarify that I was very much aware of the budget submission. What I was very encouraged about was that not only in the SBDC cuts, but where did we also make an addition, an increase? And I was very encouraged at the veterans outreach, which is really top on, our, on all of our priorities. But with the SBDC, okay. I still have to get close okay. into the mechanics so of I, how they're going to apply thank the you budget. For, thank you yes. for your answer. My, so I, I just want to be very clear that I reject uh, such a steep cut to this and that uh, we will do everything within our power um, to uh, to fight that. Um, yes. We have done it before. We will continue to do it. We cannot continue to add more responsibilities to the SBDCs like cybersecurity and, and other legislation that we passed here and expect for them to do more with less. It, it, it sounds good. It sounds great, but it doesn't work. It didn't work before. It will not work going forward. Would I like My, to look forward to come back to you to tell you how we're going to manage sure. that. Sure. And uh, in terms of the uh, disaster loan program and, um, and um, uh, Ma Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, the OIG report uh, for Hurricane Maria revealed mm -hmm. a lack of Spanish translators caused significant delays in the post-Maria response. So what is your plan to make sure that there is adequate translators this time and in the future? Sure, we'll and, 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 and let's remind everyone, mm -hmm. members of this committee, that the United States and the U.S. territories are part of the United States yeah. and that they are. In Puerto Rico, we have 3.5 Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And we could have the best program but if they are not um, provided in their own language, it will not do any good. Well, I want to assure you, uh, Chairwoman, that I looked deeply into this particular issue of the IG, uh, all IG and GAO uh, audits, but in particular this one because we're still working with Puerto Rico. We have 90 staff people there. We have 16 offices, and we've learned that a uh, $50,000 bilingual software program and consultants was not going to meet the needs of what happened in Puerto Rico. So they have invested, we have invested a $2 million contract to ensure that we can blow up or scale up to the level of need in Puerto Rico. And other, and, and I advise all other agencies to, to do the same. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, my time has expired, and now I recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
Madam Administrator, as you know, uh, President Trump recently signed a very important uh, trade agreement with our uh, neighbors, uh, Mexico and Canada, the USMCA trade agreement. Um, as the first and only U.S. trade agreement that maintains a distinct small business chapter, um, how will the SBA work with our neighbors to the north and south uh, to ensure that American small businesses will benefit from increased access uh, to both Mexican and Canadian markets? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, Ranking Member Chabot, and I don't want to mess up names because I did that in my Senate hearing, so I want to make <laughs> sure I'm methodical and very deliberate about that. Um, what I've learned at SBA, they have d dedicated resources that are doing very significant and targeted um, and strategic outreach to banks to ensure that access to capital, um, understanding in, of, of the programs that we have in our Office of International Trade are understood, and that we have a, a what you call public and private partnership, a more um, strategic. And so they're on travel, ensuring that we make personal contacts on sites with these lending institutions. In addition to that, I've traveled between Pennsylvania to the um, harbor in, um, or the port, I should say, in New Orleans to verify that um, small businesses are also getting a cut in any export growth or import growth. And when I say cut, they're part of, part of, of the market, yes. Not a reduction. And, yeah, right. uh, cut is probably not the most appropriate word. That's but um, And what I was pleased to see in New Orleans was that the ports are investing significantly. I saw four loading cranes. They're going to expand it to seven loading cranes. And what I was really impressed, and Chairwoman, you're going to be impressed with this, is that the cables that are serviced on those cranes are um, serviced by a woman small business. So as, as the exports grow, the equipment on the ports expand, we're looking to ensure that small businesses have a, a role in that. So I think it's going to be a win-win the more um, outreach and the more uh, on-site visits we perform. Thank I'm you very sorry. much. You. Um, small businesses have responded uh, positively to uh, President Trump's historic uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which passed the House and, and the Senate uh, a couple of years back. Not only are small businesses better off these days with the small business 20% pass-through tax provision, but communities and small businesses also stand to benefit from opportunity zones. Um, under your leadership as administrator, uh, what will you do to ensure small businesses are aware and take advantage of these beneficial tax provisions? I believe there's a 200... Um, opportunities, grants, funding opportunities throughout the entire federal government that are aligned to support the Opportunity Zone underserved markets. When, we, when I've spoken to, whether it's the 8A conference or um, large um, groups of um, small business gatherings, I share that there's 8,700 tracks in the underserved market we have hub zone, we have um, microloan lenders, we have um, the opportunity zones, and now uh, we're looking at um, concentrating not only resources but funding, appropriate funding uh, for those communities. So we're looking at it in an ecosystem other than just one program called the opportunity zone. It's how can we marry or align all others to reinforce and that the small businesses are aware that they have an opportunity in those areas. Thank you very much. Okay. I think I have time for about one more question. So let me ask you this. Um, you've got a very impressive background both in the government and the private sector. Um, how does your experience in the private sector, whether it's uh, uh, UPS or, or otherwise, uh, you know, obviously starting your own small business, um, how, how has that affected your ability to bring those skills, uh, those resources to the public sector and, and specifically now as our top person in the Small Business Administration? The very early lessons that I learned in the private sector was understand the mission and align everyone to pursue that mission, clarify it. So communication is very key. I also uh, worked with thousands of employees, which um, uh, the learnings about developing strong teams, 
which is uh, very um, necessary to really see the results. And there's also a need to measure impact. And so those are the three components that I'm looking at, optimizing our resources, measuring their outputs, and making sure that we are uh, meeting the needs of our stakeholders. We would say shareholders in the private sector, but in this case, it's our taxpayers and our small businesses. Thank you very much. My time's expired, okay. but I just, on behalf of, I think, members on both sides of the aisle here, both Democrats and Republicans, we look very much uh, to working with you and making sure yes. that your uh, your time as top SBA official uh, is, is successful. So we want to work with you. Thank you Thank very you. much. I look forward to it. Gentlemen's time has expired, and now we recognize the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations, for five minutes. Uh, Administrator Carranza, I would like to touch on the outgoing, uh, the ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 or the 2019 novel coronavirus, which has had a negative impact on the small businesses in my district in Los Angeles. My district has one of the largest Chinese American populations in the, na in the nation, and I've heard firsthand of xenophobia directed at Asian Americans and an avoidance of Asian American owned small businesses, especially restaurants, but based on misinformation about the disease. And just as some examples, when this first started happening, there was a flyer that was handed out, and you can see here it has a gigantic fake on it because it actually dared to uh, have the logos of the World Health Organization in the County of Los Angeles and then said that there was a cor coronavirus outbreak and named five small businesses to avoid, but it was totally fake. And yesterday, uh, CNN did uh, in interviews and articles uh, with a restaurant in New York's Chinatown, and it showed that it had no customers despite the fact that there were zero cases of novel coronavirus in the state of New York. And in fact, the restaurant owner said that now her restaurant is suffering a 70 to 80% loss of business. This is actually pretty typical of many of the uh, Asian restaurants, certainly in my area, that caused us to have a press conference to say there's a lot of misinformation going on. Please do not believe it. The fears are misguided. The US CDC says at this time, the virus is not currently spreading in the community of the United States and dispels many of the myths that are out there. So um, Administrator Carranza, I think that the SBA uh, can play a very, very important part in combating this misinformation and supporting the small businesses that have been unfairly targeted. Would you consider offering an official statement uh, urging SBA's resource partners and audience to combat the spread of misinformation that's resulted in xenophobia, uh, echoing what the official comments of the US CDC is about the truth of the coronavirus. Congresswoman, I will do something better. I've already um, called on my disaster assistance preparedness um, leader to hold a um, conference with all of SBA on Friday. Uh, we're going to uh, assemble um, a steering committee to anticipate what do what role can we play, and you've already stated we can serve as a communicator. We have 1,000 offices. We have 2,000 executives. So we definitely could have a strong voice and support um, communicating the truth and being very timely about it. So on Friday, we're going to address, as if we had a disaster, what proactive measures can we take? How, you know, what essential staff do we need to identify? Because we're, our first concern is our employees and then our businesses, and then of course any mandates that we have from uh, our, our administration. So I look forward to working with you, especially the California uh, perspective. And so um, I look forward, again, uh, well, coming up with a strategy. But I, I, uh, yeah. I, I agree, I think SBA could play a significant role, so much that we're going to launch a meeting on this Friday, this week. And well, we'll keep I thank you. Posted. you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for that timely uh, response, and ho hopefully a statement can come out of it that uh, dispels the misinformation. Um, well, thank you for that. And uh, let me also say that one of the most uh, pressing issues for our owner, uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs in my district is access to in-language services and materials 
Too often, immigrants and non-native speakers are simply unaware that the SBA offers services like uh, entrepreneurial development programs at no cost to them. Um, so I am encouraged that the agency improved its Spanish language offerings, but in districts like mine, there are communities that are rich with entrepreneurs that, that whose primary language is Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and other languages. So can you discuss how SBA plans to improve language access, particularly for these other languages and its written material, services, and outreach? I know that our um, Office of Entrepreneurial Development has various, um, I want to say, library of, of uh, languages that are available. I can't tell you exactly which ones, but they're in the teens. So um, what I do know at this point, and it's evolving, is our lender match, which is really access to capital, which is really key for small businesses. Um, that is uh, going to launch in Spanish so that they can identify a, a potential lender a match within 48 hours. So I will add other languages to that and we will report back to you. At, at this point, I don't know what's in the queue mm -hmm. uh, as to what other languages, but Spanish is uh, being launched very, very soon. Time has expired. Thank you. Gentle lady yields back. And now we recognize uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure. Thank finance. you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and yes, I am the ranking member of the Contracting and Infrastructure Subcommittee. The chairman of that committee is the Congressman uh, Jared Golden. He and I have heard from small businesses across the country of some of the challenges that they face with uh, the federal procurement space. A couple of questions. Uh, what is your vision for improving contracting opportunities for uh, our small businesses? And then what is your strategy moving forward to ensure that we eliminate much of the fraudulent behavior or detecting and removing ineligible firms from our contracting programs? Those are discussion topics that I've had since uh, the first week I arrived in uh, government contracting uh, because of its um, uh, WASB and certified.gov issues and technology and transparency and also because there were um, discussions about the sound and, and uh, what do we call it, the safe and soundness and uh, fraudulent situations that have occurred. I inquired as to the schedule of reviews, and I've been told that typically they'll review about 500 of those particular firms. They may find about 12 firms that uh, are crossing the line and need to be require further review. So I know that we have a strategic team that is looking at that, but I think we can uh, provide better solutions from an automation perspective where we can detect early on. Uh, right now it's a latent process where it's all manual and it's uh, a, a particular group of um, firms that are reviewed. And I, I need to get further involved in exactly how that is processed so I could uh, be a little bit more thorough with you. But I, I do know that they have systems in place, but are they sufficient is the question. And I think that uh, you know that uh, any time a small business doesn't get the contract because of uh, you know uh, fraudulent applications, that uh, it's a considerable uh, lack of a term, considerable insult to those small businesses because we have to be the the protector of the small businesses and your agency uh, has to be a part of it as well. Yes, Congressman, there is an appeal process and it, um, it is exercised. Um, the timeliness is one thing. The other is the loss of revenues and that's what I'm targeting is anytime um, we don't detect an issue, we're preventing or impeding job growth and wage growth and, and fairness in the system. And a couple of uh, other comments. The access to capital is, uh, is uh, really, really important for our small business. As I go through Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, Rural District in Northern Minnesota, that's uh, one of the number one things they talk, talk about is the access to capital, uh, making it uh, um, a bit more uh, easier for them to uh, attain that capital. I think that's uh, extremely important. The last comment or question I'll have is, uh, Administrator McMahon visited all 68 SBA's districts office in, in the 50 states. How will or do you uh, anticipate you're going to continue that legacy of, of, of uh, cross-country outreach? Let me share that I had a town hall meeting with my workforce the second week I was there. 
And I was asked that question by my districts, like, are you going to do, and they uh, reiterated uh, what you indicated. And I said, no, because I, my goal uh, in, within these short months is to cover every region and every um, small business within those regions that are like either government contracting or in trade. So I'm going to be very strategic. I, I don't want to falsely say that, yes, I'm going to visit all 60 districts. I'm going to visit the 10 regions. And I'm also going to uh, visit the um, small businesses that have strategic needs, whether it's trade, whether it's Puerto Rico. I have a plan to travel in Puerto Rico. I have a plan to travel to the Port of Miami, and so I'll visit small businesses there. So my visits are going to be very strategic and, and uh, multifaceted. So but, I, you, uh, but my outreach is going to be very healthy. Would you commit to Minnesota? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Yes. Thank you. After New York and after Puerto Rico, and uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Administrator, for your time, and I really appreciate it. And Ohio and Iowa. And thank I you. appreciate uh, your, your leadership uh, in many uh, areas uh, of uh, not only private business, but uh, our, uh, our nation as well. It's a real um, honor. Thank you. Madam Chair, I, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentle lady from Kansas, Ms. Davis. For five uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And uh, thank you for being here to testify uh, today, uh, Administrator. I look forward to working with you uh, to make the SBA the best possible uh, admin, uh, agency that it can be. So I was, I was happy to see in your testimony um, an emphasis on increasing and improving, and improving counseling services uh, for accessing capital for women and minority, minority entrepreneurs. Uh, those are major priorities of mine, and I... Uh, I'll take my time today to focus on those uh, critical areas. So I represent the third district in Kansas. Um, I don't know where we are in the queue for a visit, but uh, Ms. Finkenauer and I were just talking about a Midwest swing, so um, well, we would welcome you there. Um, so we are, in addition to uh, the just like vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem that we have in the Kansas City metro area, uh, my district is home to the Women's Business Center. It's located in Fairway, uh, Kansas. That's the Women's Business Center for the state of Kansas, and it and it does a little bit of work um, across the border with with our neighbors in Missouri. Uh, the the WBC, as many folks know, and I'm, I know you're aware, uh, does counseling for uh, women business owners and entrepreneurs. And I'm doing everything that I can to help be supportive of that program. In fact, uh, Congressman Hagedorn and I introduced the Women's Business Center Improvement Improvements Act of uh, 2019 to make sure that we increase the support for the women's business centers. Um, so. Getting to the, the question here, with the importance of that type of program, I was a bit disappointed to see that in the president's proposed budget, there were cuts to entrepreneurial development programs, including a 23% cut to the WC, WBC program. Um, I guess I'm curious, how do you plan to support these uh, important programs like WBCs, uh, small business development centers, re regional innovation clusters, uh, given the... Uh, stance of the administration and, and the cuts that were proposed in the budget that was sent over. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, based on the numbers, and I may be incorrect, but I believe that what was requested in 2020 for women's business centers was 17400 and we have requested the same amount. What was uh, um, enacted and, and requested is, is the difference that, we're, that you're highlighting. Um, but at, at this time, the, because of my focus, and I said in my opening statement when I was in the nomination process and when I met individually with the Congresswoman and her, her um, I was going to say staff, but her uh, members, as well as um, the, the Senate, the focus is women because women right now reflect um, like they, for the past two years, especially in 2019, we've exceeded the workforce the male workforce for the first time. And that's a significant feat. The other is that our trajectory of small business growth happens to be very strong in the women. So as a result of that, and I know that our um, staffing on the women's business centers is being reviewed. I'm actually conducting interviews to identify a very talented candidate to run those centers so that we can be uh, responsive, 
relevant to our communities, Kansas being one. Um, I visited three women's businesses, an architect in the STEM area, architect, an engineer, and each one of them had their business development, the procurement person from the district office, et cetera. And they said, I don't know where I'd be without this support. So I know that that outreach, that handholding is very essential. But let me share what I learned in Pennsylvania. I visited a woman who took over her family's business, four restaurants, wanted to expand to two restaurants, got an SBA loan for $2.4 million to expand with the potential of hiring 150 employees. I said, this is a win-win proposition. I asked her, what, serv what other services has she accessed? She didn't know about women's business centers, she didn't know about um, SBDCs, and she didn't know about SCORE. So we immediately connected her with them. That, that's too off that happens too often. And when I speak to Hispanic women and ask business owners, how many of you have access the resource partners or the, the services and products of SBA, maybe a third of them will say that. And I said, that's too few. And so I leave the SBA.gov. That's my new name. But I, I am in agreement with you, and I look forward to working with you on how, if you have some recommendations, how more we can exploit that opportunity for women. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for your response. And uh, we, I am sure our office will be reaching out to good. you so that we can continue the conversation. Okay. Very good. I yield back. Gentle ladies, uh, the gentle lady yields back. And now we recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Spano, who is the ranking member on the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Appreciate that. And thank you, uh, Administrator Carranza, thank for you. being here with us. And good luck uh, in your responsibilities, and I'm sure you're going to do a great job. I know it's a lot to take in. I, you were formerly the Deputy Administrator of the SBA, so I guess my first question to you is, you know, can you share with us what you learned as Deputy Administrator that you, coming in, you're like, all right, this is what I learned on the ground as Deputy Administrator that I'm going to implement or I'm going to do or I'm going to focus on or an attitude that I'm going to come into this with. If you could share that with us, please. Well, I was very encouraged that what we worked very hard at um, improving, which was government contracting for small businesses, had had uh, taken a, a very positive trajectory the past 10 years or so. So we didn't lose a lot of ground there. I was very encouraged there uh, that the focus for women finally took hold and that we have now very concrete systems in the government contracting, such as WASB and Certified.gov. So we're looking at ways of um, engaging and interacting digital-wise. So we're becoming much more automated. That was a win-win because we were so archaic back then. The, the other focus is that every office is, is looking, ways, looking for more efficient ways of providing the services and products. And, and for me, it's the taxpayer impact, the return on investment. Mm -hmm. And I believe that every office at SBA is very committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we have exceptional institutional knowledge at SBA. We have employees that have been there 10, 20, 30 years that are technocrats when it comes to government contracting, SBIC, small business investment corporations, um, access to capital, uh, every kind of loan portfolio you can think of, micro loan. Um, so I'm just very enthused that no one has taken their sights off of the mission, which was really to develop and strengthen um, start, grow, and expand small businesses. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, when we met several weeks ago, now it's been, um, we were yes. introduced, um, amazing how quick time flies, but I, I mentioned a concern that I had uh, with respect to the um, veteran-owned small business set-asides for government, government contractors and uh, spoke to one of your staff members about, uh, at least as it was explained to me, that um, when an application for a contract is submitted, it's or maybe the, in the process of becoming qualified, you verify, you, or you don't even verify, you self, uh, you state yeah. that you're a veteran-owned small business, and then it's and then at that point it's referred when the contract is awarded, if I'm not mistaken, to the small business, and then it's the small business administration's then job or responsibility to verify or confirm or do the legwork 
to ensure that that is, in fact, a veteran-owned small business. I had a, as I shared when we met last, I had a, a gentleman I met with from my uh, district, uh, veteran-owned small business, and it, at least it was his position that he characterized it as stolen valor. He said there were individuals who were just stating, hey, I'm a veteran-owned small businesses, and they're getting contracts, and, you know, there's three sides to every story, usually, right? What I want to make sure is that if I can maybe get some follow-up on this issue, uh, I'd love to f have some confirmation so when I get c confronted with constituents, and particularly this gentleman, that I can say, no, no, we're ensuring that the veteran-owned small businesses that are applying for these set-asides are, in fact, veteran-owned small businesses and that they're not uh, being used by individuals uh, unscrupulously, fraudulently, and, you know, that they really are being set aside for the, for the people that we intended them for. Could you speak to that for a moment? Yes, Congressman, I took heed to every con uh, member's concerns for the veterans contracting. And so I think it's in a week, if not two weeks from now, I'll be attending a veterans um, conference and I will be articulating all of the changes that we're making, the resources that we've identified, the systems that we're um, reevaluating, and then, of course, target those these particular issues. I, I'm not the type of person, nor is anyone in my office right now in the government contracting office, shy from um, admitting that we have shortfalls and, that, and then also be transparent enough to discuss, and these are our action plans to, um, to correct. So before I attend that conference, I'll share the information with, with the members here. Well, I, th I thank you for that, and I appreciate your commitment to looking into that and trying to resolve those issues if, in fact, there are problems there. Now you yes. back. Gentleman yields back. Now we recognize the gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Finkenauer, Chairwoman of Subcommittee on Rural Development, Agricultural Trade, and Entrepreneurship for well, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, happy to be here and also happy to have you here, Administrator Carranza. It, it means a lot to be able to talk about these issues that matter so much on our committee here. Um, and as the chairwoman said, I am the chair or the chairwoman of Rural Development, Agriculture, Trade, and Entrepreneurship, one of our subcommittees, the Rate Committee. Um, I joke that next year we need to add growth to it and we can be the Great Committee um, because it is something that matters a lot to my state in particular, um, especially when it comes to trade. I am from Iowa, in Iowa's first congressional district, and I wake up thinking about trade, I go to bed thinking about trade, in the middle of the day I am talking about trade, um, especially, again, after the last 18 months that our state has been through, given uh, some of the decisions from this administration. Um, I will, I'll go into that a little bit more later, um, but I do want to highlight something that has been really important to me and also to our ranking member, of the, my Republican colleague, Dr. Joyce, as well. Um, we've been fighting really hard to actually increase the funding for the Small, Bus Small Business Administration's entrepreneurial development programs. We actually brought 47 members together, both Republicans and Democrats, to, re to request funding, and we succeeded in that. Um, these programs have bipartisan support, and I'll be frank, I was shocked to see that Trump administration decided to slash this budget and funding for fiscal year 2021. I was especially surprised to see that nearly 60% was cut from the straight state trade expansion program. See, the STEP program is something that matters a great deal to my state and to um, states all across the United States, but very, again, specific to Iowa. Um, when we have been getting hit on all sides, especially our farmers, um, from, again, this ongoing trade war with China um, and uncertainties in markets, um, we've had, I mean, I've had farmers into my office telling me that they're looking at filing for bankruptcies, dipping into 401ks. We had a woman testify saying that she's telling her three sons not to go into farming because she's so worried about their future. On top of that, our ag economy in Iowa and our manufacturing are very closely tied together. So if our, if our farmers are not doing well, they're not buying John Deere tractors, which are made in our district, and John Deere isn't then working with our local contractors, also small businesses in my district. Um, I, this is, again, and why I wake up thinking about it and go to bed thinking about it. Um, and so on top of all of this, 
you know, this is a time when we should be caring about making sure that our small businesses have access to foreign markets and making sure that our small business administration has the tools that they need and the funding that they need to be able to provide that access or to provide that support for our small businesses. Um, so, you know, this is again something that we've been highlighting, we've been working across the aisle on. It's a program that was heck, developed by Democrats, funded by Republicans, and then a Democrat and Republican have sat here this last year trying to make it better. It's not a perfect program. We saw actually uh, inefficiencies that were not working well, where, whether it was um, some of our states, especially in Iowa, not being able to get uh, the, the, um, the programs being required or um, they would issue a uh, they would issue a request, not hear back. They weren't hitting, I mean, there were not deadlines being hit by the Small Business Administration. These were things that we should fix. And that also, I realize, does require funding to make sure that we have the right folks there being able to fix this um, and make these programs work like they should. Um, these are being used. Uh, you know, we held a hearing, actually not a hearing, but a round table in my district where we had a gentleman named Ryan show up. Um, he works with Marion Process Solutions and they've been using STEP since 2015 and actually in 2019 were actually able to use it to launch a new technology at an international trade show in Nuremberg, Germany in April of 2019. I mean, this is the time Time again when we need to be investing not cutting and um, my question especially when it comes to this program and I know hearing about the agency's strategic plan to enter to increase the value of small business export sales how do you intend to do that if we are cutting steps funding by 11 million how do you intend to increase the value yeah yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, the the focus that I've had is not only the budget, but where it's going to um, impact performance and what do we have to do to rectify um, this perception that we're not going to be overall effective at SBA as a result of this current budget. We have operating expenses and we have grant programs, and the grant programs I've learned historically are are appropriated or their statute or they're not a firm fixture, unfortunately. Some have. And so I'm looking at ways of how we can efficiently, more effectively provide the services and products. At the same time, work through, through with this project, a uh, uh, budget, excuse me, without compromising any of the services that you're referring to. The STEP program is, is active. 11 million is quite a bit to cut though, correct? I mean, we the the program started with 18 million. We were able to plus it up to 19 million, and now mm -hmm. 11 million is going to be cut from it. What what I'm looking at is that there is only two programs that um, have experienced a request reduction, and it's not as significant. You know, a million here. Um, you know, when you look at the budget overall. Um, We'll be able to manage all the services, keep the staff that we have, revisit the staffs that we are contemplating on bringing on board. Um, it's an overall evaluation, and I look forward to getting back to you once once I have yeah, this a deeper is, dive in, in every one of these indices. This again, it, I'll tell you again, coming from Iowa, this is another, it feels like a slap in the face from this administration when it comes to trade and what our state has gone through. When again, we need to be investing, making sure that our folks have more markets and what we've dealt with in our state uh, has been devastating. But Con Congresswoman, we have over $800 million dedicated to providing services and products to small businesses. Small businesses- And trade is incredibly important, I mean, and I am absolutely. not happy to see the 11 yes. million be cut, but I, I understand my time is up. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairwoman. Um, now we recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would, uh, would the gentleman yield for just a moment? I certainly would. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. Just to clarify a couple of things that have been mentioned, I don't want to take much of the gentleman's time, but we've talked this morning, the gentlelady from Iowa just talked about cuts in the president's budget. Um, every administration puts out a budget. Their suggestions, uh, we oftentimes hear the term debt on arrival. 
by the time Congress gets done with these things, uh, we very seldom cut anything. We've got a $23 trillion debt hanging over our heads. Um, the president's making an attempt to actually be responsible. But by the time we get done with this, these will all be plussed up. Um, and maybe some things will be flat Would the gentleman line. yield? Well, it's his time, but... Okay, I, would you I'll, yield? I'll just... <laughs> uh, I, I, to, to the chairman? Uh, chairwoman? Yeah. Yes, I will. Thank you. We want to be responsible. The president wants to be responsible. Why pass a trillion-dollar tax cut that favor big corporations and small businesses are an afterthought? That is being responsible. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, again? I'm not sure I'm going to get to ask much uh, today. I certainly thank you will for yield yielding. The Th thank you. Uh, larger businesses did get their tax cuts. Small businesses got their tax cuts. Eighty-five percent of the American people got their tax Sunset cuts. Sunset it. They will expire 2025. I know, I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle like raising taxes. We like cutting taxes. It helps the economy. Uh, but getting, getting back, uh, I'll yield back. But, uh, Reclaiming my time. We'll see, where these all end. <laughs> we'll see where these all end up by the time I like we're done. the chairman and the ranking member, and I may not get an opportunity to do much more than express a concern. I will connect it to the conversation in saying that uh, we can do just as much devastation by uh, an, an, a thoughtless regulation as we can by inadequate uh, appropriations. Would the gentleman and yield? You will have one minute more. Okay. Thank you, Madam yeah. uh, Chair. I certainly will then. Uh, I'm sorry. Did, were you seeking, asking me to yield again, Madam Chair? Uh, uh, thank you. Just to let you know that I, oh, thank I'm you. extending. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to focus a moment on a topic that's important in my congressional district. I've mentioned before uh, how important the poultry farming industry is in North Carolina 9. Uh, in, uh, in the 2017 uh, U.S. Agricultural Census uh, ranks my district 29th in total sales of poultry at more than a billion five, more than 1,500 uh, producing producer farms in my district. Um, the SBA Inspector General has uh, created sort of a, a, a great deal of uncertainty by uh, suggesting that poultry farms are ineligible for 7A loans um, because of the agency's affiliation standards, i.e. affiliations between small farmers and integrators that, uh, that uh, produce poultry. Uh, and, uh, and on February 10, an interim, final interim rule was published um, and I'm, I'm glad it doesn't explicitly eliminate poultry farms from 7A eligibility. And in fact, the final interim rule explicitly said it was not SBA's intent to do that, to eliminate lending to poultry and, and other livestock farms. But I am concerned that SBA chose to reinstate a standard that had previously been removed just in 2016 because this totality of the circumstances rule was so vague that it created uncertainty and potentially chilled that area of lending. Um, the, I can tell you that one of the most hard-pressed forms of, of a small business is a small livestock farmer uh, who, who is, under market circumstances, working, th working with an integrator. And uh, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I guess I would just say, because I think I've got to reduce my, my questions or, or condense them here, uh, Madam Administrator, I want to sensitize you to that issue of that because we're still supposed to be doing poultry farm, poultry lending, poultry farmer lending, I understand. But I'm concerned that there's been created so much uncertainty uh, and vagueness in the standard under the rule uh, that it will be untenable for lenders to do that. And I would like to know whether you're focusing on that and uh, whether you have a plan to make that a tenable area of SBA lending. Thank you, Congressman. One of the first um, topics that was discussed or reviewed with me before I went through my nomination was the poultry issue. And since then, I have been uh, brought up to speed. But I understand that um, the 7A program and lending opportunity is still appropriate and still available. And it was more about the independence between the, at that point, it was the chicken industry that we were referring to and also the chicken farmers. So it's about protecting the chicken farmers and their ability to, as they access capital, that they're, they have the independence and the ability to repay. And so that the industry is not um, demanding or having more control than necessary that would influence or impact. So it's a fairity uh, um, issue. Um, 
and I'd look forward to discussing with you in your office uh, exactly how we're approaching this. It, I believe that there's still um, a 60-day commentary available, and so um, uh, the the uh, it goes into effect a couple of weeks from now, but there is a 60-day um, commentary so that we can have greater input. I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Madam Administrator. I look to being look forward to being in conversation with you on, on an ongoing basis about that issue. It is a, a critical one and, and Absolutely. these are hard pressed small businesses mm -hmm. that need to be need to have access to capital. And thank you for the additional time, Madam Chairman uh, and ranking member, I yield back. <laughs> Welcome. The gentleman yields back. Um, and now we recognize the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Golden, Chair of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last month, the, the committee held a hearing to review the operations of the Office of Field Operations. And we're aware that the historical FTE count for the office has approximately been 800 employees. Uh, today, that's 690. Uh, looking at the President's budget proposal, uh, it requested more funding for the salaries and expense account uh, and I wanted to ask if that's going to be targeted towards increasing staff in the Office of Field Operations. Congresswoman, a quick answer is yes. I have about 160 people in the pipeline right now to be considered for employment. Uh, the priorities are in the field offices as well as uh, one other targeted program office. Thank you very You're welcome. much. I appreciate that. Um, and. Obviously, uh, when you're able to, could you send any of that, a summary of uh, how you yes, intend absolutely. to spend those priorities? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the particular priority offices that we've discussed today have a weekly update, and I would be glad to share would, any progress reports with you. We would like to see that. Thank absolutely. you. Uh, just following up on, on the, the field aspects a little bit, uh, you know, I represent Maine. Uh, I have the second most rural uh, district in in the House of Representatives in the largest east of the Mississippi River. It's a it's a big territory. Uh, rural America encompasses about 72 percent of the nation's total land and about 46 million residents. And we all know it plays a critical role in our econ in our economy. And recognizing this, Congress established the Office of Rural Affairs at SBA in 1990, uh, but it wasn't until the middle of last year that the office. Uh, received a, a, a director, essentially going over 20 years uh, without any uh, attention whatsoever. So that's not to blame this on the Trump administration, uh, but rather many administrations uh, under the leadership of both parties, as well as a failure on the part of Congress to pay attention uh, to what it clearly identified as a priority in the 1990s, and it's no less a priority today. Um, now, that was uh, a new position, uh, the director for this office, uh, was staffed only after members of this committee and others in Congress sent a letter uh, pointing out this discrepancy between the statute uh, and, and the reality. Uh, director Michelle Christian was uh, appointed in August of 2019. Uh, our committee has been sending uh, letters over to SBA asking for details about how we plan to use the office and the position. Uh, I've, I've had the director in my congressional district. Uh, you know, if you go to the website and look at uh, some of the proposed work, there's a real emphasis on opportunity zones and helping uh, businesses maximize uh, that opportunity. Uh, that's, I think, absolutely great, uh, but it's not nearly uh, enough. Uh, I think it falls far short of, of what that office should be capable of doing to help small businesses. Uh, you know, in fact, I've, I've been working on legislation to allow opportunity zones that aren't getting invested in rural communities to be moved. Uh, you know, we're not uh, Democrats here aren't all opposed to uh, tax opportunities and, and incentives where we, we see that it, it makes for good policy. Uh, but I've also written legislation to reauthorize small business development centers. Uh, there are great resources out there that rural Americans pay taxes, uh, you know, they pay taxes that create these programs and they deserve to know that they exist and that there are free services there to help business owners and entrepreneurs in, in rural America. So this is just a long way of asking, uh, what are you going to do with this office? What kind of resources are you going to give it? Because from August of 2019 up until now, um, there's only the director and some part-time uh, assistants. The president's budget requested nothing for the office whatsoever. It looks as though, to me, they responded to uh, a request from, from Congress uh, in this committee to prioritize rural America, uh, but they haven't followed up 
uh, to show how they're actually going to make it a priority. So I'm asking you uh, how you envision using this office. What kind of resources are you going to give the director? Because uh, if, if there are none, it's like setting, it's setting her uh, in the office up to fail. To fail. Congresswoman, I, I agree with the focus on the rural. I made reference to it in many of my um, conversations that rural and underserved women, veterans, broadband in the, in the rural is, is very necessary. I understand there's just, um, just recently been some significant investments in broadband in the rural area. And we've done the same at SBA, not from a technical broadband perspective, but support. And what I'm looking at, and, and I'm going to answer your question in two manners. Yes, Michelle Christian is a dedicated resource to a rural, but she is not the sole uh, individual. Uh, we have, um, you mentioned 690 people in the field. I'm, I'm planning to augment her role by also adding rural as part of their portfolio, which has been ignored since 1990. And there's a great need. I'm, I'm also looking at when there is a district office that is not either the lease is out or uh, we have to revisit, um, should that particular district office be there or, or a resource partner office be open closer to a rural area? Because now that is a focus and that has not been in the past. So I'm kind of re redirecting resources to ensure that rural is a priority. And every district director, if you want to check, has rural as an indice to track. Thank you very much. Time Thank has you, expired. And now we recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Chair Lady and Ranking Member. And I'll try not to say anything that I'll need to be interrupted by, <laughs> by anyone. Uh, I just ask you some straight up questions. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Um, can you? Exp I, I was county mayor for eight years. I was in the state legislature and back in Tennessee for 16 years. And we cut programs, we cut things, and I understand uh, you cut duplication. Things are antiquated and. It seems like, especially in county government, every one of those uh, has a constituency, and it's generally a, a county commissioner's cousin or something like that that's involved with it. And why are you cutting their program? And so, um, and I understand that, but can you explain what some of the top objectives are to help uh, decrease duplication in programs across the SBA and other government agencies? I had it on before. I appreciate the question, Congressman. And I'm glad you pointed out that you were a former mayor, because I believe that we can do a better job of integrating our uh, resources and our efforts with mayors and governors. I attended a, um, an event with mayors, about um, 100 plus mayors, and then also, and women mayors, to see what kind of reinforcement they needed, support and knowledge with SBA. I also had uh, two roundtables with governors, and uh, their top of mind subject was small businesses. And so I believe that if we can optimize public-private relationships, we don't have to add more brick and mortar that we can't support. So redundancy is an issue for us. If we have um, collab strategic collaboration with the other agencies, such as HUD, such as Commerce and whatnot, we can we can do a lot more with a lot less. So I look at efficiencies um, in scale. Uh, and and I, I'm also looking at the, the talent that we're bringing on to SBA so that they can be more visionaries and have greater capacity um, to align themselves with the needs of a market. You know, I look at, and I, and I share this with the staff, the GDP of small business is almost 11 to $12 trillion a year. And so we have to be better at servicing that, that kind of GDP in the United States. And that's my goal. Okay. Well, and this is, I guess, the million dollar question. What can we do as Congress people um, to, to uh, remove some of the roadblocks that are placed in the way of small business in your administration? Well, that's a very loaded question because I don't know which roadblocks I'm facing right now, but um, I'm sure I'll be working with your office if I uh, approach some. But I believe it's a, a matter of working together in a, in a very bipartisan way, which I believe this committee does really, really well. Um, small business is big business, and uh, Congress can always look at ways that small businesses have a seat at the table when working on trade or working on 
um, legislation, that we should always be at the table, especially when we contribute that significant amount of GDP. Okay. I'm going to run out of time, but specifically dealing with um, entrepreneurial development, how will your office enforce accountability of the, um, the SCORE program and the reform efforts at the SBA and at the SCORE Association? That's already begun, Congressman. I've reviewed some of the metrics that have been um, further developed and all the, as well as the reporting mechanism, that is to say not only on paper and online, but um, on site. In other words, reporting to the individual, the AA, who's responsible for those resource partners. Thank you, Chair Lady. I yield back a minute and five seconds if you and the, and the ranking member want to battle it out a little more. We, the gentleman's please, time. Please go ahead on my time. Thank you. Congressman. The gentleman's time has expired. And now we recognize uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedzon. Uh, thank you, Chair and Ranking Member. It's a, a pleasure to have you here, Administrator. I think it's nice to see you again. Uh, I want to follow up just a little bit on what uh, Representative David said about the women business centers. We do have a, a bill to improve that to expand it, and uh, you know, my wife is a, uh, a business owner, and from many other uh, small business owners that I've spoken with, uh, they said that you know sometimes it can be a very daunting task to get things up and running or to expand, and so I think that what you're doing there at SBA and others with that program is very effective, and we'd like to uh, gain your support for our legislation, which has passed the House, and uh, hopefully we can continue along those areas. Or, uh, do you have any? Uh, words of wisdom that you'd like to say about what you're doing at SBA to continue on with the uh, Women Business Centers? I appreciate the question because uh, that, as I indicated earlier, it is a, a focus of mine. It's not just uh, in words, but in action as well. I plan to visit the Women's Business Centers myself, not just reading the right. shortfalls uh, in an IG <clears throat> report. Um, they're a very necessary entity in the community, especially now. Um, there's discussions about child care. There's discussions about workforce development, and I think they're going to be essential. You know, we're working with HBCUs, and we're targeting HBCUs of, of per, per, perhaps being the future entrepreneurs or the future interns at SBA or um, the future um, new district directors. So we're looking for opportunities to really diverse, not only in sector, but in demographics as it relates to the leadership. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, I had uh, an array of small business owners in my office. So my minority businesses, women businesses, veteran-owned, and they're, this, is, this is what they tell me. They tell me that uh, a lot of 8A contracts, uh, you know, things that are, they have concerns with the SBA on how things are administered, that sometimes the approval of what's called the contractor's teaming agreements, I had to write that one down, is delayed so bad that they miss the opportunity to even participate in the request for proposal. And so, you know, is there something that you're working on in this area to make sure that the bureaucracy doesn't slow down the process so much for them that they can't even participate and put in their bid? I appreciate the fe feedback, and I'd really like to get closer to that particular issue so I right. can, go can go back and check the root cause and uh, analysis. But I do know that there are shortfalls. There's an IG report that, sh um, that demonstrates, articulates the gaps, and we're working with the um, government contracting office to address all those IG all right. issues. Well, we'd like to follow up with you and your staff on that Absolutely. And, and give you some examples if needed. I look forward See to it. See how we can fix that. Thank you. And uh, also... Um, in the past, the United States Department of Agriculture and the Small Business Administration have uh, had an agreement where they're going to try to expand operations and do things in rural areas, rural communities. Uh, do you intend to continue to work with USDA on that? Will, uh, have you met with Secretary Perdue, for instance, or do you I've, have that on um, the horizon? Uh, we spoke about a future meeting to discuss that MOU. I know about it. Um, it occurred um, recently, I think in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. And I so I right. look forward, yes, so I look forward to um, implementing it in a great way, uh, very strategic. So I appreciate you can it. commit that I'll be working with him in the very well, near future. Thanks for your leadership and your time today. Thank you. We'll follow up on that other issue. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I yield Thank back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Snyder. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you and the, the ranking member for having this hearing today. Uh, Administrator Cranzo, welcome 
uh, as a fellow Chicagoan, it's, it's yes. good to have you here uh, and uh, wish you much, much success as we continue to work to support, nurture, and grow our, our small business sector. Um, representing the Chicago suburbs, uh, the communities I represent are already facing the increasing impact of climate change. In fact, in just the past number of years, we have faced three 100-year floods. 11 years, three 100-year floods, including instances that have indeed triggered the uh, SBA's Disaster Loan Assistance Program. We had a field hearing in the district last summer uh, that examined the strains on this program. In our case, we were focused on the impacts of an upstream development uh, just across the border in Wisconsin that it would have in my community. Uh, Wisconsin to attract a, a Foxconn to building a major facility there, irresponsibly waived critical environmental reviews, risking exacerbated downstream, downstream flooding in our communities, directly impacting communities that uh, are dependent on their small businesses. While we mentioned climate change at the hearing, it very well could have been the central focus of the entire hearing. I'm concerned that the federal disaster programs are not keeping pace with the increase in severe weather that we're already seeing as a result of climate changes. Uh, Administrator Kranza, the SBA's fiscal 2021 budget justification doesn't even mention climate change or the expected impact it will have on the disaster loan assist assistance program. How is the SBA taking into account the expected strain that climate change is expected to have on the program? Excuse me, Congress. That's a good question, and I look forward to um, working with you on this Wisconsin suburb uh, situation. I don't have uh, a specific um, strategy or um, um, position on the, inv the Climate Change Disaster Office. I'll, I'll have to get closer to that. I don't know if it's part of their current portfolio, they've been asked in the previous administrations, but at this point we've been looking at Puerto Rico, our focus has been there, and then also with the coronavirus. So, And, and I understand it's, it's a relatively new position, but having spent uh, my career before coming to Congress working with small businesses, doing strategic planning, looking to the future, making decisions where mm -hmm. to invest and when to invest, the uncertainty of climate change is going to be a burden. The need to address it is, is going to be critical. I think there's a, an important role for your agency, for the entire government to play to help address that. Um, switching gears here to, to talk about uh, 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 women-owned small businesses. Uh, uh, it's so critical to, the, to help these uh, businesses uh, prosper and grow, like all small businesses. Um, we have made the decision to have set-asides distributed throughout the variety of federal contracts, not be relegated to just a select few categories. Um, a company in my district raised, raised concerns, concerns, which I have shared uh, with the SBA, that these set-asides are not represented in certain NAICS codes, particularly industries where uh, women businesses are, are underrepresented. We know the SBA has a set government-wide goal of 5% for federal con contracts with women-owned uh, small, uh, women small businesses. Uh, the SBA's budget justification notes that the federal government spent 4.75% of small business eligible contracting dollars on women uh, small businesses, women-owned small businesses in fiscal year 2019. Administrator, how will the SBA continue working towards the goal of 5%? Thank you for the question. It's to improve the relationships and the oversight with all of the other federal procurement. Uh, we've been asked to also look at how we can facilitate it. It's very difficult for small businesses, as you know, you've been told, to contract uh, with the federal government. And so we're, we're trying to partner with the states also that as we're looking at streamlining our approaches, our regs, could the states also look at ways, because small businesses usually contract with states before they contract federal to get the experience and the evaluation. So I look forward to working with you on, on ways right, that we and, can improve that. Uh, thank you. And as I, I've said from this chair before, we have and will continue to have uh, workshops in the district on contracting uh, for the federal government for all small businesses, but as well as women-owned and minority-owned uh, small businesses. It is a, a um, oftentimes torturous process mm -hmm. uh, that if we could simplify and streamline, that would be wonderful for everyone involved. But in the meantime, making sure that these companies have the, the skills and, and resources they need uh, to, to reach that goal, but making sure that for your um, 
department as well as all of us here, uh, that we focus on the goals, we measure progress towards those goals, and ultimately uh, find paths to achieve those goals. With that, I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you, Congressman. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Shabbat, uh, Administrator, thank you so much for being here today. As a small business owner for the past 35 years before coming to Congress and in Congress, I'm excited to see how you'll be able to help American small businesses throughout the tenure of your SBA at the SBA. That said, I'm also the Ranking Member, as the uh, Chairwoman mentioned, and which oversees the SBA 7A loan program and have questions regarding its recent rulemaking on this program. In the SBA's interim final rule on express loan programs and affiliation standards, the SBA modified the regulations surrounding the 7A program. This rule includes a new test for determining whether two entities are considered affiliated. However, the rule has several dates tied to it. The SBA's comment period lasts until April 10th, but the changes go into effect on March 11th. That's kind of a problem. For the record, there are only two things that have come before this committee that have made me somewhat angry. One was the SBA asking for $99 million subsidy on an unreleased arcane formula. The second is this. Uh, just a few questions. Why is the SBA making these changes take effect before the comment period is even closed? I'll have to get back to you on this. Uh, Congressman, I I'd like to get back to you on, on how that was derived. I have just learned that that's how it's going to be implemented? Well, I would hope with your new leadership role that we would, I, I think, uh, without making you go on the record, I think you would find that somewhat problematic for a rule to go into effect. So it, it would indicate you don't care about what the comments are. And when I say you, I'm saying your, your organization. Right. And um, we, I, I reserve comment on your leadership yet until we continue to see how this plays out. But uh, I would appreciate you getting back to us because I want to ask you a question for the record. Uh, my assumptions are is that you consider farmers, farmers as business owners, correct? Yes. As a, as a matter of fact, what the details that I have on the particular rule is, I, as I mentioned, it, it's a 60-day commentary extension. Mm -hmm. uh, we've worked with the Department of Agriculture as well as OMB um, to position this, and so it's a matter of, like, really getting into the details to get back to you on this, Congressman. Well... And I appreciate your thoughts and your comments, and I, I'm assuming that uh, you will work to extend that so that we have the opportunity to actually listen and for people to comment and look at the rule and make sure that it's something that we can work with and to give you actual comment that matters. I look forward to it. Okay. And, you know, as we work on fixing these things throughout your tenure, there's also a issue with, uh, with banking. As a f founder of a small bank, I'm interested in the CFPB's rulemaking, which will affect our banking industry and their ability to lend to our nation's small businesses. Uh, the CFPB is promulgating a S Section 1071 rulemaking, which requires financial institutions to collect data on lending to women and mi minority-owned small businesses with a goal to better screen for discrimination. This is an important goal, but the rules must be calibrated so that the data collection doesn't burden or force our leaders out of the small business lending market. And given the SBA substantial expertise in this field, would you agree to work with CFPB on the significant policy decisions in this rulemaking? Of course, yes. And then lastly, since uh, the recession, community banks have seen their share of small business lending stall, and non-bank lenders have regained market share, even though small business ex express lower customer satisfaction with the service provided by non-banks. Once the CFPB's 1071 rule takes effect, banks will face the provision for data accuracy requirements and fair lending analysis, while non-banks will likely not have the same level of scrutiny. Are you concerned about this unlevel playing field between the two different types of lenders? I'd have to look at the uh, CFPB. I, I know of it. We've worked with them closely uh, well, when I was a Treasury, uh, but at SBA I have not really um, delved into that, and I look forward to working with you on, in, the, in that area. Well, thank you. I've, again, I want to state for the record that I'm a huge supporter of SBA and what you do for small business uh, owners and helping them get the, on, the capital to start a business, create jobs, put Americans to work. Uh, as you know and have seen in your short time in the job, there, there are a lot of unanswered issues out there. And um, we've been very critical of, of past people who have come and testified from the organization, from your organization, that have been 
not quite informed on being able to answer our questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to having you back here as quickly as possible to answer the many questions you've gotten today because they're very critical to the, the people who are out there trying to make this economy work for them and, and help people get jobs and start on the pathway to create the next big company, the big, next big thing in America. Well, Congressman, I can assure you that um, those first few weeks that I've been on, on board, I have met with the banking uh, trade associations as well as women's trade associations to get input from them as to what they've realized, what are their members um, sharing with them, and, and also how particular regs are affecting them. I have to definitely get closer to working with them because it's a matter of a meet and greet. You don't really get uh, an opportunity to break down specifically what needs to be fixed, but I look forward to continue meeting with uh, Nagel because I, I met with him already. Uh, I'm sure there's other associations and other members that would like to speak with me. Thank you. Time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. And now we recognize the gentle lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Holham, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's a pleasure to be introduced with you. My name is Chrissy Houlihan. I represent Pennsylvania 6th, which is just outside of Philadelphia. I have spent most of my life as an entrepreneur. I'm obviously a woman. I happen to also be a veteran. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be talking to you about these essential issues. And so if it's OK, uh, my first questions have to do with uh, access to capital, which as a small business owner uh, was definitely an issue. I, I remember putting my, my house on the line for signing a lease for a copier at one point in time. Uh, and I particularly am intrigued and interested in access to capital for underserved areas. My community also includes a a, a city called Coatesville and the city of Reading, both of which are opportunity zones. And so I read uh, in preparation for this, and this is just directly from the report, the first strategic objective in SBA's strategic plan of fiscal year 18 and 22 is to increase the number of loans by 5% to small businesses in socially and economically disadvantaged urban and rural areas. In FY19, 20,527 SBA-backed loans were made to small businesses in socially and economically economically disadvantaged, disadvantaged urban communities and rural areas, the agency fell short of its projected goal of 26,749 loans by 23%. You have, have apparently stated publicly that by that creating more opportunities for women, minority, and veteran-owned small businesses will be a priority of yours. And so I was wondering if you could comment on how we possibly fell short on our goal by 23%. What, if anything, you're aware of we could have done so, so that we could have access to more, more capital be possible? And also, you know, how you're going to reconcile the fact that we already fell short with the idea that we should increase that idea. The approach that I've used in learning um, of any program performance deficiencies or areas of opportunity would be to speak with the entire staff of those particular offices, the uh, uh, Office of Capital Access. Um, as in any review, you're told about all of the great things that we've done and all of the billions that have been um, made available to small businesses and the number of jobs that they've created. Uh, but but there's always a, a, an opportunity and there's more that we can can do and so that's my investigative role to to ensure not only to meet the government contracting targets but to exceed them because we this is our window of opportunity we have a great economic boom I think there's um, a tax kind of um, not haven but opportunities for small businesses to take advantage of and we should be there with all of our loan portfolios to support yeah, I definitely agree that in, in my experience, measuring what matters is really important, and it feels as though sometimes we don't ask the right questions, but we get the answers that we deserve because we don't ask the right questions. Uh, and I also feel as though you kind of led me into the next question. In terms of those opportunity zones, my impression in my first year here is that my community of Coatesville and Reading many of the folks who are already there as small entrepreneurs are not being uh, allowed to have access to those loans or don't know they exist at all because, frankly, of more predatory, more opportunistic folks who are coming into the community and taking advantage of those opportunities uh, from a small business perspective. Can you reflect on that at all, and how can we make sure that people in the community are able to access these loans? I'll, I'll do a dual hat on that, Congresswoman, as I respond. You know, earlier we were talking about uh, access to capital as it relates to overall um, um, the underserved market. And we identify the underserved market as being the women and the veterans and um, minorities. Um, that's why we're working with HBCUs to, to 
dive deeper into those communities. The Opportunity Zone is, is, a, is an opportunity for small businesses to really um, be able to grow and see perhaps an injection or, or uh, of, um, of uh, investment from these huge funds. But the other, the other area with regards to women access to capital is the CDFI. I served on the CDFI board and I don't know if we really maximize their network or their opportunity because I think the more uh, alternative lenders there are, I'm, I'm talking about micro lenders, the greater penetration we can, because the micro loans are anywhere from fifteen thousand to twenty-five thousand. Not too, not everyone has a two hundred fifty thousand. I spoke to um, a group of a hundred Hispanic women, and I told them typically what we borrow from is our grandparents or our dad or something to that effect or a credit card. And so we'd like to start eroding that and and have more micro loan lenders available and I think there's an opportunity there and that's 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 going to be a strategy that I'd like to build further with my my leadership. I, I look forward very much to working with you on these particular issues and my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Time has expired. And so um, with that it, it concludes uh, the committee works today. I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank you, Administrator Carranza, for being here with us and sharing your priorities uh, for the SBA. The committee greatly appreciates uh, your commitment to improve SBA's program and services for America's small businesses. We really look forward to working with you to see that progress is being made in certain areas, as you heard from our committee members. And with that, I will ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statement and supporting materials for the record without objection, so order. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.